what we're calling career technical education, also called experiential education, learning by doing. Uh, it is a, a kind of a way of approaching educating our kids that allows them to see the connection between academic learning and a real, a real adult future for themselves. It's been shown to keep kids in school, keep them from dropping out, preparing them for both college and careers, and is really a highly, highly um, successful and inspiring way of reaching out to many of our students. This bill would do three things. It would protect our uh, relatively new state and local CTE investments at a time of increasing focus on academic testing and on uh, increased flexibility. Uh, number two, it would set up a mechanism for regional cooperation so that the four current funding streams for this kind of education could be combined and there could be real collaboration based on um, working partnerships with the local business and professional communities and built around local economies. Uh, number three, it would set in place a series of accountability measures uh, specifying that the sequences of classes that lead uh, into this kind of career study would meet the standards of the California Department of Education CTE standards and also the common core academic standards so that our kids are prepared for, for life and work and lifelong learning. <laughs> Um, it is going to be very important in this time of great flux in education funding that we protect, I think, certain, uh, certain ways of educating our kids that have been shown to work but may be relatively new and not as highly tested at the moment. Sorry. Nicole Rice, California Manufacturers and Technology Association. Um, I just wanted to talk um, to, to the committee about our interest in this bill as an industry that values this type of education experience. Manufacturers need a technically trained industrial workforce. It's one of the issues that um, they consider when thinking about expanding or locating in the state. And California used to do a really good job at training and, uh, students for industrial careers. But as the senator mentioned in her opening statement, with budget declines, with flexibility in career tech education funding, there's been a significant drop in the program offerings for these types of courses, making it increasingly difficult for our industry to find individuals with the right skill set for the jobs that we need. And as a quick example, we have a member company in San Bernardino County that has uh, expressed to us that when they are testing and interviewing interviewing candidates for entry-level positions, that they are lucky to find two out of ten of those applicants that actually have the skills that they need for the position. And their challenge becomes increasingly difficult when the knowledge and technology skill level of the position increases. And as the gentleman before me said, that in manufacturing, the workforce is aging, and as that workforce continues to age and retire as they should be able to do, we are going to need to replace those workers, and therefore we're going to need to have students that have industrial skill training. So we're happy to support SB 660, which will maintain and grow career tech education funding, and then add the necessary outcome review process that we need to ensure that the hands-on skills that students are learning are actually those skills that translate to the needs of California's industries. Thank this you. bill represents our desire to build upon and strengthen the governor's local control funding formula, our LCFF. We share the governor's goals of a more rational and transparent school funding system with increased local control and additional resources for disadvantaged students. As such, this bill, starting in 2014-15 school year, repeals the revenue limit and categorical funding structure that has been on the books for decades 
and replaces it with a streamlined and more equitable funding formula. That new formula consists of a uniform base grants for all students differ differentiated by grade levels. It also includes a supplemental grant of 35% for each student identified. income, English learner, or foster, uh, or foster status. The base grant amount, as well as funding amounts for county offices of education are left blank for now in anticipation of uh, higher revenues for schools in the May revise. As we know more about the revenue picture, we will begin to designate specific dollar amounts. We, infor we are fortunate this year that we can anticipate more money to work with. Um, our schools desperately need these resources. So while embracing the bulk of the governor's formula, SB 69 omits the governor's proposed additional supplement called the concentration grant for the reasons that this grant is not distributed equally to all students from similar backgrounds. The concentration grant is targeted only to those students enrolled in districts with more than 50% disadvantaged students, making some students, even though they may be very disadvantaged indeed, invisible by virtue of their zip code. The bill now states intent to redirect those concentration grant funds to the supplemental and base grants in proportion to be determined when we know more about state resources. Now I want to focus on the amendments I will take in uh, committee today. These amendments are an effort to put, quote, meat on the bones of some of the intent language you see in the bill now. First, we stated, we stated intent to strengthen the governor's accountability proposal in several ways. One of those is to ensure that supplemental funds granted by dis generated by disadvantaged students are in fact used to improve services for those, for those students and not to supplant existing resources. The supplement, not supplant amendment, is designed to accomplish that. Second, we will also be incorporating some of the elements of by SB 223, specifically the loss of funding flexibility in districts that do not show stronger academic outcomes for those very groups of students about whom we are very concerned. On the accountability front, let's stipulate we have more work to do. Specifically, to define the appropriate state response when districts don't succeed in, in closing achievement gaps. We await as well the governor's own revision to his accountability proposal in hopes to find common ground there. Third, we state intent to protect important state investments in career technical education programs for high school students. We will do that by tying in the elements of Senator Hancock's SB 660, which we just heard. That bill protects ROPs, partnership academies, agricultural vocational education, and specialized secondary programs and, establish, and, and establishes an important and flexible regional framework for CTE and linked learning. Lastly, we, stated, we state intent to uh, attend more closely to the needs of English learner students. We will do that by tying in elements of Senator Padilla's SB 344, which we heard this morning. This bill ensures a higher level of parent involvement and requires a district level master plan for English learner education. This bill, SB 69, is still a work in progress. We have more work to do on accountability, on home to school transportation, on ensuring adequate services and attention to foster youth, on working out the levels of the base and supplemental grants. But the most important thing today is that we have begun the work in earnest. We also do not have an official position on this bill, but I did want to um, express our extreme encouragement by the direction that the bill is taking as it relates to preserving and maintaining career tech technical education um, funding. We also um, appreciate the amendments that the author took related to linking the passage of SB 660 to the effort that's taking place uh, in this bill. And as I said earlier, uh, these programs are very important to manufacturing. It's an education uh, experience that we value as an industry, and we are thankful for the direction that the Senate is taking on this issue. Thank you.